Awesome. Okay. So I'm Ryan Counter. This is my talk. Uh, we're we'll talking about themes today. I love themes. Uh, we're talking about boilerplates. So starter themes, frameworks, parent themes, the differences between them, fun stuff like that. Um, you can get my slides. The link's at the bottom. I left that up. So if anyone wanted to get those really quick. Um, I'm Code Pro Kid pretty much everywhere on the internet if you want to get at me. So a little bit about myself. Uh, I've been using WordPress for about six plus years now. I uh, switched over from like Cold Fusion, and Flash, and fun, outdated stuff like that. Um, I love WordPress. I love talking about WordPress. Unfortunately, I'm the only WordPress developer in my office, so I love coming to WordCamps and just like getting all my WordPress like geekiness out during the weekend. So this has been a great weekend for me. Hopefully, all of you guys are having a great time too. Um, I'm a transplant from the East Coast. I live in Denver now. I uh, moved there a couple months ago. I'm really happy and excited to be out here this weekend. Uh, props to all the organizers uh, for putting this great WordCamp on. Uh, they're really the people you need to thank. I mean, I literally just showed up here. So thank organizers when you see them because they are awesome. Uh, I work at an internet marketing company in Denver called Fruition. Uh, we do a bunch of stuff, WordPress, uh, Drupal, Magento, marketing, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Uh, a little fun fact for you, I have a rabbit named Mama, and she is awesome. Um, so stuff I'm going to talk about today, um, and some questions you might have coming into here. Uh, so you could be building a custom theme, and you're wondering, you know, where do I start? Um, you could be building custom themes for like a good amount of time now, and you're just tired of doing the same things over and over and over again on every single theme, um, which is stuff that I've dealt with in the past. Um, or you could just be really on the nose and just wondering what the difference is between a framework, a starter theme, and a parent theme. So all that's cool. We're going to go over all of that stuff today. So a little bit of uh, the overview. Um, so the problem today, clients want the world but only have a dime to pay for it, right? So everyone kind of deals with this a lot. They're like, I want all this functionality. I want geolocation. I want it to email you smiley faces every day in your inbox, whatever. But we have like 100 bucks for you to do this. Um, and then you're kind of left with like trying to figure out like a good solution for how you're going to do this, how this is going to scale in the future. And all these things you have to worry about on like limited time, limited budget. This is stuff that I've done so much in the past. Uh, and I'm really happy to share my experiences with you guys. Um, another thing is you could be working with some awesome designers, but your development team isn't really at the same pace as them. So you have these really great out of the box designs, but you just don't have uh, the tools or time to actually implement them. So that's where all these starter themes uh, come into play, is saving time so that you can build better products. So if your first line of code that you write is your doc type, you're probably doing it wrong. Any of you who have like, dug into WordPress core would probably get this joke. Um, but yeah, it's a function in WordPress core about, uh, that gets called any time that you could be possibly doing something wrong. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, we don't want to be starting from scratch every time, right? That just, is, just makes no sense because there's so many tools for us to start from somewhere and then we can get further along. So using a parent theme, start theme framework is just a great way to speed up your development of your sites. Um, and it's without compromising your integrity. So you, you don't have to go and use all third party code and then have to worry about, you know, is their code good? I don't know, like, and then have to worry about going back and uh, supporting it later. So this is kind of super stretched out, which sucks, but um, I kind of relate it to, if you ever played Mario Kart, there's like, uh, one of the levels has like a really awesome shortcut in it that you have to like jump into to get into it, and you like end up in first place every single time. But if you miss it, you end up there like in a dizzy and you're in last place. So really similar to uh, like parent themes and frameworks and stuff, if you do it really well, it's going to help you out so much. But if you don't do it well, don't do it the right way and pick the right tools, you're going to end up just in a total dizzy, making your life harder for yourself. So that's what I'm going to try and help you out with today. So first type of boilerplate uh, would be parent themes. So parent themes are awesome. They're everywhere. And anything can be a parent theme if you give it a child, right? 
So parent themes are really there uh, to utilize child themes to modify them, right? So you have your parent theme, you create the child theme, and then that is how you modify them. So some advantages to using parent themes is that they're extremely easy to work with. Uh, they have like the lowest barrier of entry to get going in custom theming. And the process to modify it is also really simple. So the way you would modify like a file in a, when you're using a parent theme is you'd create your child theme, just copy and paste uh, that file out of the parent theme into your child, make your edits, you're good to go. That will now overwrite the file in the parent theme um, and you'll get that functionality. So also, out of the box, it comes really complete. It comes with tons of bells and whistles, like everything you could possibly need, pretty much. Um, and for a lot of people, that's great, because you know, they load this up and you, know, you feel good about it, right? Like you see something on the screen, there's something there. Uh, so it feels like you have a lot less work from you know, starting there to get to where you're trying to go. Uh, some disadvantages are that a lot of them employ the kitchen sink method, so they kind of just throw in everything that you could possibly need into there, and then you know you might end up only using like 20% of that functionality, and then 80% of it is just sitting there waiting for a security vulnerability or something like that. Um, so it leaves you with a lot of unnecessary uh, template files, bloated style sheets, not great stuff. Um, also, they sometimes require a lot of work to override code, um, just because if you're trying to like do one thing, you have to like backtrace like a function that's like getting called through like four different functions to finally find what you need to override. Right? Um, can be a total pain in the butt. Um, also, if you're trying to just change one line of code, like you just need to change a class or something on a on a, uh, on an element, you still have to copy and paste that entire file just to. Uh, change that one line of code. And then once you do that, you're now responsible for all that code. So if there's a vulnerability in there and then the uh, theme author pushes out an update, you're not going to get that update because your file is overriding the parent's file. So kind of a disadvantage there. So some use cases for using parent themes. Um, you know, people who just need to get something out the door fast, they need to start with something that's already like 50% of the way there, and then they just need to drive it home. Great for stuff like that. Uh, great for people who are just learning WordPress. Uh, this is personally like how I learned how to build like custom themes from scratch is by looking at other themes, how they were doing things, uh, and the fact that you know you have to go in, copy and paste the whole file. You know, when you go in there, you see everything, right? So you see how they're writing their loops. They, you see how they're like calling things using global uh, variables, stuff like that. Um, also, another great use case, uh, you can find you know, a theme that's you know, pretty close to like, whatever design uh, you're trying to implement, and you can just make the small changes. Uh, so you could be even farther than 50%, you can be 80 to 90% of the way there with a the parent theme, and then just use your child theme to do some small uh, CSS, JavaScript adjustments. So really great for stuff like that. Um, these are just some like examples of uh, some some parent themes. I don't like personally endorse any of these. None of these have like affiliate links or anything. Um, but just so you know, if you need something to like visually look at to understand what I'm talking about. Uh, so yeah, there's like Foundation Press, WP Forge, Bootstrap uh, Theme, Cork. So like a lot of these come with uh, like front end frameworks built with them. So it'll come with Foundation already. Uh, so it's something you don't need to install or worry about. Um, so yeah, they have a lot of stuff baked into them. So the next type of boilerplate that we're going to be looking at is starter themes, uh, which is personally one of my favorite, and is kind of the step up uh, from parent themes. So a starter theme is the base theme that is meant to be hacked on top of. So usually the first thing you do when you get your starter theme is you rename it, right? So you get it, and the first thing you do is go into style CSS, you know, rename the name of the theme, put your name on it, and that's what starter themes are there for. Uh, and they're, off they're often bare bones. They don't usually come with too much baked into it. Like when you open it up in your screen, there's pretty much going to be just HTML there. So some advantages of, uh, of starter themes uh, provides a great foundation for a developer to start off of. They, they're not starting with the doc type. They don't have to write your WP head, your WP footer hooks in there. They're already there for you. Uh, but at the same time, they're not super bloated. 
So they also normally include some useful utilities for developers to use, uh, stuff like trimming ex excerpts down to like custom sizes, stuff that WordPress doesn't do inherently, uh, but it's just really useful for custom theme authors. Uh, and your end result ends up being pretty lightweight because you're not getting that kitchen sink bloat that you end up with uh, with parent themes. Some disadvantages of it is that there's no global updates. So once you rename that theme, it's not going to get an update ever. So if there is a security vulnerability in the starter theme that you're using, you're going to be responsible for that, right? Um, and the barrier to entry is a little bit higher. Uh, you, you just, need, you just uh, don't start off with quite as much. So you need to end up doing more work. They're often a little less complete. So again, you don't get all those utilities in, in the parent theme. But you still get enough to start start off with, and uh, yeah, as I said, there's usually more work for the developer. Some use cases for starter themes: uh, you're comfortable with building themes, and, but the parent theme that you've been using is just too bloated, and you know you'd rather write most of the stuff yourself. Or maybe you just need the basics to get you started. You're making a really basic website. You don't need all the bells and whistles. Um, or your site is 100% custom, totally out of the box, crazy stuff that's never going to be in any other theme anywhere, and using something else would just end up getting in the way. So some examples are underscores, which is probably uh, the most popular uh, starter theme out there. And then there's Sage, which is part of Roots, um, which is another popular one, or Bones. So next, uh, yeah, sure. And these slides are, will be up as well. Thanks. Cool. So next type of boilerplate, uh, theme frameworks. So theme frameworks can come in a lot of different shapes and sizes. Uh, you can see them come in plugins as uh, you know drop-in code, or uh, maybe they're just built straight into a theme. Um, so their theme frameworks are normally focused on extending core functionality. So it's adding functionality that you wouldn't normally have in core, right? So there, there's a lot of them that focus on verticals. Like there's a couple out there that do like geolocation. So if your site is 100% based on geolocation, you can use a geolocation framework um, and build your site around that. Um, like I said, they come in different shapes and si sizes, um, can be implemented in a number of different ways, which make them great that they're so flexible. Um, and they're pretty popular amongst, lar amongst uh, large theme shops. So some advantages of frameworks is that they do a really good job of separating uh, visual from functionality, right? So the good thing about that is when you're worrying about like different components of your website, you only have to deal with one thing at a time. So if you're dealing with this complex functionality issue, you just go into you know, your framework where all that functionality is happening to modify it. And you don't have to worry about breaking you know, the front end of the site and uh, vice versa. It also offers a way to update global functionality without modifying the visual integrity of your site. So if you're using a framework that's in a plugin, right, you can modify that with functions and still have it update normally so they can fix security vulnerabilities. And that's not going to affect anything on the front end of your site, which is really nice. Um, they usually have tons of hooks and filters to easily modify stuff so you're not stuck with that uh, parent theme dilemma of you know pulling out an entire file just to change a class name or adjust parameters that, go, that are going into a function. There's usually tons and tons of hooks, of, hooks and filters to allow you to do whatever you want to do. Um, and this ends up making content extremely portable. So what I mean by that is that everything in your database is labeled a certain way, right? So when we make a post, custom post type and give it a name, every post associated to that custom post type has that name in the database. So when you go and switch themes, and if that post type is registered in the theme, that content is now pretty much gone. It's still in your database, but it won't show up in your admin, won't show up in the front end. Whereas your framework, all of that data is uh, coming from the plugin itself, right? So you can switch themes, and all of that data will still be there, which makes your content extremely portable, which is very cool. 
Um, some disadvantages is it's probably the highest, highest bar of entry. So a lot of these frameworks have their own documentation for them. They, they take different approaches to how they write code. And you really need to commit to a framework and dive into it and learn it to really be successful with it. Um, it can also often lead to some redundant code because it contains some unused features. A lot of them come with like visual page builders and cool stuff like that. But if you're not going to be using it, it's just going to sit there and bloat up your admin, make it slower to load, um, which can sometimes be a pain. So some use cases. Um, a lot of your sites share like the same functionality sometimes, uh, especially if you're working within a very specific like business vertical. So for example, I used to work for a company that helped insurance brokers do marketing. So we had about 600 websites on one multi-site install, and we had our own framework um, that provided functionality for all of those websites. Um, so there's, there's a lot of shops that do, you know, specialize in marketing for like a specific niche. And this is a great way to build out uh, functionality like that for all of your themes to use. Um, another reason could be, you know, hooks and filters are just your shit. Like that's like what you love doing, using hooks and filters or stuff. Um, and like uh, that's comfortable workflow for you, then uh, framework should definitely be something you look at. Um, some examples of some frameworks. So Genesis is an extremely prop popular framework. Um, so that comes with a plugin, and then you use it with themes that they provide as well. Um, Themosis is another popular one. Uh, Carrington Core is a pretty nice one from uh, the guys at Crowd Favorite, um, and then uh, Thesis is another pretty popular one as well. So this brings us to the DIY route. Right, so this is the point in my career that I'm at where I can no longer be satisfied by other people's uh, code, their, their frameworks and starter themes and stuff. It's just gotten to the point where it's not enough for me. So some of you may be wondering, you know, where do I start with this um, if you're going to go this route? So the way that I did this is I looked collectively at like the last like 50 websites that I had built for my company. Uh, I looked at them, I looked at, and I listed out all the features that I was sitting there building over and over again because they weren't in uh, my starter theme. And there were definitely a lot of similarities in there uh, that you know just didn't make sense for me to build over and over and over again. So that's something really great to look at is just have a retrospective of what you've been doing and figure out the things that you've been doing over and over again and just wasting time. Um, another great thing to do is dig through code from other themes. I mean that's that's one of the best ways to learn is look at what other people out there are doing, what features that they're implementing that you think is cool. Um, or, if you want a head start, you can always fork another boilerplate. So this is just some of the stuff that uh, is in like my, my starter theme framework, just to give you like an idea. Uh, like a logo uploader, right? Every website needs a logo. Why are we you know, hard coding that in or you know, making that dynamic field on the back end every single time? Um, you know, custom sidebars is a huge thing that we had from clients is they're like, I want on this one page, I just want this, this different sidebar. And as like the developer, you're like, well, like I could put in like an if clause just for that page ID, but then if that like page ID changes because you make another page changes, I have to change this. So uh, that was something that we wrapped into our framework. Uh, Favicon uploads, social links, every website has social links, uh, social feeds. I, for the longest time, could not find a social feed that I liked uh, just because they, they were so difficult to modify the front end because they're integrated with all of that back end API call stuff, uh, which kind of drove me nuts. So, built my own. Um, slider functionality, almost every site has sliders no matter how much you fight with clients and tell them they don't work. Um, uh, custom widget classes, just stuff that like WordPress is inherently missing because you're in that 20% niche that they're not going to add that feature for. Um, yeah, and then like from the development perspective, uh, add stuff like debugging functions, which can uh, help you code faster. Helper classes, uh, especially if you're using like a front-end framework. Uh, stuff to, like remove like padding from certain sizes if you're using like foundation or whatever. 
uh, stuff for like breadcrumbs and the custom login logo. It's the stuff that you would. It's the stuff that you'd never do yourself if you're just starting from scratch. But if you do it once and then it's done on every single website that you do from then on. Uh, it's like the easiest thing in the world. So like for me, I have like a custom uh, login logo, like little module that changes like the WordPress logo on the login screen to the client's logo. And to them, they're like, oh wow, this is so personalized and everything. But to me, like I spent 15 minutes like writing the code for it and now like every time I just upload like a logo to it and it takes me 10 seconds to do. But to them, it's awesome. Yeah, we might get started things. <laughs> So my starter theme is proprietary. Um, the reason why is because I have a ton of dependencies in it. So like I use like advanced custom fields for stuff, uh, and I know a lot of people probably don't do that. Um, and the time it would take for me to write all those fallbacks would be kind of absurd. Um, so I'm hoping one day that I can write one, um, but it's like on that to-do list that's like 10 feet long. I'm sure you guys know. Um, so yeah, advantages of having your own custom framework, theme, whatever, you have 100% control of your code base, which I am a total control freak when it comes to code. I trust very little code, uh, mostly because I've been burned so much in the past by other people, um, and I'm sure a lot of you guys have probably experienced the same, so I'm just kind of jaded in that sense. Uh, whereas I like to you know, either review all the code myself or just write it all myself. Um, also, you can make assumptions that you wouldn't normally make, stuff like where I use advanced custom fields for everything. I can just write that like advanced custom fields register code or PHP or whatever uh, into like my small plugin that I need to do something with because I'm not worried about releasing it to the world. Um, and also, it can be tailored to all of your needs. So it's as light as it can be while still offering you everything that you need. And that's something that like you just can't find out there uh, just because everyone's trying to cater to the needs of everybody rather than your needs, obviously. So some disadvantages is you have a long road ahead of you, I promise. Uh, I'm on version... Uh, I think like five, five of my own uh, uh, boilerplate, and it's been through five entire rewrites from scratch. So those are my, those are like my major milestones. Uh, so it's gonna be a lot of work, and I finally feel like I have it at like a place that like I'm comfortable with. But yeah, it took me uh, three or four years to get it to that point. Um, so yeah, it requires a lot of work, uh, some deep knowledge of, of code, but in the end. You're going to be happy. Uh, so yeah, some use cases for this. Uh, you have trust issues like I do. Um, or you know, your clients have very specific needs. You, know, you can work with a specific vertical. And you know, the only person who is going to understand those needs is, is you, because you're the person who's working directly with them, rather than some third party developer that's pushing out code for absolutely everybody. Um, also, my other issue is I'm the only developer in my department. I manage over 80 websites, and I have to push out about four or five completely custom websites a month. So uh, I need them as close as absolutely possible to done by the time I start. Um, so that's why I go the complete custom route. Also, the other thing is, in a lot of like marketing companies, work usually comes in waves. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of high times, a lot of low times. This is great stuff to work on when you, got, when you have downtime. Um, you learn about core, and you're going to speed up your process once you get into those high, crazy times. So at this point, you might be asking, which one is right for you? <laughs> That's my answer. Um, so there's no one size fits all. Uh, and I feel like that uh, a lot of people either look for that answer or a lot of people try to give that answer. And I think people trying to give that answer is extremely irresponsible. Uh, there's not going to be something that's going to fit everyone's needs. You need to do your research and find what's right for you. Uh, but seriously though, experiment, download some stuff, look at some source code, uh, something that piques your interest, just mess around with it, uh, see if it will work for you. Uh, and next, this is something I do all the time. Whenever I get uh, frustrated because I'm doing something that I feel like I've done a thousand times, I make note of it in a notebook. 
And then I go back when I'm like reiterating on my personal boilerplate. I go, I should probably build this in so I don't have to do this ever again, right? Um, and there's a lot of options out there. I mean, I listed a couple in here, but that is definitely not the full spectrum, and I'm definitely not like the total end-all, be-all of information on uh, boilerplates. There are hundreds and hundreds of blog posts out there about boilerplates, which ones to use, niche ones for certain things. So just get out there and look, and uh, you should be able to find something for yourself, for sure. Um, so yeah, that's really all I've got. Um, I would love to take questions if anyone has any. Yes. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. So um, you said that your own framework went through like five complete rewrites. Five um, complete, yeah. So what's your pro is it that bad, or what's your process for updating? So, so no updating. So mine are starter themes. So I start from scratch every time. So the first thing I do when I take uh, when I like clone my framework. Uh, to start a new project is rename it to like the name of the project I'm working on. So there's no backwards compatibility whatsoever, um, which is extremely scary. Uh, but now I'm at the point where it's not quite like that anymore. So I've started moving stuff into really small plugins, uh, which I feel like has been talked about a ton this weekend, which is really cool. There's just like micro pr plugins that do like one or two really small things. Um, and then I use um, this great plugin, it's called like TGM, like something activator. It manages plugin dependencies, so you can uh, give it like a, uh, like a, pretty much like a JSON string of like uh, your plugins and where to like download them from. So like when you spin up the site for the first time and activate that theme, it'll just like activate those plugins for you. So you can have like 20 or 30 like small plugins in there and not have to worry about those dependencies. So that's like where I've been moving is trying to move all my functionality into micro plugins. Yeah. Yeah, and then you can have global updates for it. So yeah. I noticed you didn't mention the Redux framework. Is that something to look into? Yeah, so yeah, I looked at Redux. Um, for like a hot second. Um, it's really only like an options framework though, right? Yeah, so that's really like a, like a drop-in framework. I don't think I like mentioned any other drop-in frameworks in here. Uh, but yeah, I mean, those are options. Um, yeah, I mean, those are kind of different than like frameworks though. They're like frameworks. I consider them option frameworks and not theme Advanced frameworks. Custom Tools also has the options, right? Yeah, I that also has options. Pro uh, I think so. I don't know. I have the pro version, so <laughs> I don't know. It's in the pre version. Uh, but yeah, so as far as like theme frameworks go, it's not really a theme framework. Like Genesis is a yeah. theme framework, right? Where it has like options to do all that stuff on the front end. So okay. yeah. So if I understood you correctly, you said that you started off. Um, Framework and uh, I'm sorry, your own theme, and then you added the plugin functionality of like social share and things like that into the framework. But now you're you're deciding not kind of separating that out as micro plugin. Yep. So uh, I used to just put all of that functionality into my theme, right? And then I would just duplicate that theme and hack on top of it. Even though like I'm not, I'm never going to touch that functionality that I wrote. Uh, it did, you know, it works, <laughs> you know. Um, so now I've taken that out of the theme and put it into micro plugins so that I can update it. So for whatever reason, if well, actually, if Twitter changes their API again, which is a very real thing that happened recently, um, I can just make like a global update that points to like the new endpoint, and then all of my social feeds will still be fine, rather than backtracing all of my other sites and fixing them individually. And also, if you don't load in the plugin, it's less. Right, exactly. That's the other thing is that I can like pick and choose these small like modules um, to like activate. So if like a theme doesn't use like the the Twitter feed, I just don't need to activate it. It's one less thing to worry about. When do you decide um, when you're going to create your own plugin versus use the standard plugin? Uh, usually, when I get like frustrated enough from like using a regular plugin when I feel like I'm just like hacking on top of it and have to write like CSS important a hundred times because I can't change classes is usually like the point when I when I go over. Yeah. Yeah. How do you handle ACF and data definitions between the and the, the micro plugin? Um 
So you're asking about like storing the data, yeah, like in the JSON folder usually goes with the theme by default, but it's kind of just more of a plugin thing maybe or not? Um, I do keep it in the theme for the JSON. Um, you can't. There's actually like a filter for that where you can like choose where to store it. I'm like 99% sure because I'm pretty sure I'm using it actually. Uh, but yeah, I do keep that in the theme folder, but it's mainly because uh, I only track my theme and Git rather than the entire install. Um, so like that's the only thing that I push up to my environment, and then like I use that like plugin dependency manager to manage like installing all of my plugins. So yeah. Slightly off topic, but advanced custom builds, I do the same thing you do, where I build off the stuff I've done in the past. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to get from that JSON file and re-import it into uh, into the dashboard as it was originally created? Um. I'm not sure, because like I know there's like the importer. I don't know if you can just import that file. Um, but so what I do for it is there's like a white labeling uh, constant for ACF that you can define. Uh, so I turn ACF like the admin off in my staging and production environments. So if anyone has to make changes to any fields, they have to pull it down to make it locally, so that absolutely everyone has it when they go to pull down uh, the site again. Um, so yeah, that's kind of like how I just handle that. It's just I do it all through the plugin. Yeah. Oh, cool. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? No. Well, thank you guys so much. I hope you guys have a good rest of your weekend.